How are you? I'm doing well, Whitney. Thanks for having me. So I started writing. I've been writing since I was a kid. Like writing and the written word has always just been the way that I best communicate no matter what I do or where I go or what my actual like full-time job is I'm going to be writing on some level and that has been like the one consistent thing. Do you have um, a preference then between uh, writing for the public or versus writing more personal um, pieces? Since I'm always writing on some level like I still keep a journal now there are lots of things where like I do love doing personal essays the live lit community here in Chicago is a great place for me to really do some of those personal essays that maybe I don't necessarily want to be published somewhere, but I still want to perform and share in front of an audience. And so I have that as an outlet for some of the like more personal writing that I do. I love doing like cultural criticism and pop culture criticism because I'm always my brain is kind of always percolating around those ideas. And so I feel like I there's just something that's just my jam. That's just where I'm always going to be. And I, I do like to kind of pull together like ideas that come that don't people don't necessarily connect certain things. And I'm always like, I'm going to try to connect this thing, this trend to this broader thing that's happening and, and, and to write about kind of like big ideas. When I was really starting to like empower myself um, as a person with low vision and trying to figure out kind of what I needed to do my job, which is in digital and online work, um, I really was just looking for how, and also I've had really bad experiences um, trying to get accommodations with HR and to like really talk about and and advocate for myself. And I was like, I just want to learn as much as I possibly can um, about like digital accessibility, but just also accessibility in general. International uh, Association of Accessibility Professionals had all these resources um, just to read about uh, like web accessibility and document accessibility, but also they have like a general accessibility, like where they really talk about the general concept of universal design um, and just incorporating all that. And so I was like, yo, this sounds cool. And I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to do it and become an accessibility professional because I actually, I was like, I want to do it and like incorporate accessibility into the work that I do as a digital strategist because I feel like it should be, it shouldn't just be like a thing that's on the side. Like it can, it should be kind of pulled into the work uh, especially for me with doing digital strategy and communications, like it should be part of that. Um, so I just basically, it took like two years because I had other stuff going on, but I just did a whole lot of reading and studying for it. And then I just paid the money and took the test and I passed. What I'm doing with it is like, what I always wanted to do with it, it was just like to have accessibility as this uh, knowledge that I can always have and pull out of my back pocket um to create online spaces that are more uh accessible and inclusive which is honestly especially now with everything going virtual um it's i end up pulling it out of my back pocket even more um because of everything that's happening and so many events and whatnot are are virtual and remote um so it has like and who knew i didn't expect 2020 to be what it is but um more than ever, I'm not really grateful that I took the time to do this study. That must go hand in hand really well with what you're going through with the ADA Advancing uh, Leadership Institute. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me a little bit, um, uh, what drew you to that program and to applying and becoming a part of it? Um, this is gonna totally sound like I'm like, being like brown nose or whatever, but it's like to meet people like you. But like, it's true. I really wanted to, like, I know what I know and I know my own experience, but I really wanted to connect with other disabled people and who have different life experiences, different, like, you know, who are different age than me, who are different, like, career path, like all of that. And I had wanted to do it. Um, 
for a couple of years, it really has been really great to meet everybody, meet you, to meet like all the folks uh, within our cohort and to share stories and to just really get to know each other, our differences and our similarities. Like I have been so enriched by it and I've been so like, it really helps me um, as I think about, like I said, that the things that I don't know what I don't know, um, because I was diagnosed older and because I really came to my identity as a disabled person older. So my experience is going to be different than other folks. And I, the, the workshops have been really great for me to like lean into some things that I was like not really able to articulate in myself in terms of leadership um and to like claim that and to like maybe not downplay it as much um and that was something that i have trouble with anyway i am somebody who will like do something i i like to take on projects and lead projects but then like if somebody's like you're a leader i'm like no i'm not and i just like run away from it and not and i don't know why i do that but i think like even with this it's given me an opportunity to like parse out for myself why I do that and maybe not do it as much and lean into those moments where I am a leader and just kind of embrace that. So it's been great for me. The pop culture work that you do, um, do you see a lot of representation from other Black female just writers talking about that subject? The thing is, there's a bunch of us out there. There's a bunch of Black pop culture writers out there most of us are underemployed. Um, like representation in journalism for Black folks is already just woefully low to begin with, but especially when you get into like arts and culture writing, the representation of people of color in general, but then you drill down to Black people and then you drill down to Black women, it just gets, the percentage gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And, smaller. Uh, and so like most, you know, black women creatives or who are doing like culture writing, you know, for the most part, you don't see a whole lot of black women culture writers in staff positions at publication, most of us are freelance. Um, and so that makes it, you know, I think there's a community and a kin kinship among writers. We all know each other, we all support each other, like it it we we do the best we can to kind of hype each other up and give support when needed but it is like you know when it comes to actual representation and the folks who really have the ability to like make this a full-time beat and to make this their full-time job and not have it be a, an underemployment situation it's still you know there's still not enough representation there among um writers a lot of us are hustling while doing other things um some of them are like me where i'm doing something that i love also doing something I love while well, you have other people who, you know, may really want to make this their full-time job, but there's just not a, a lot of jobs out there and most of them aren't going to go to Black women um, just because of the structural inequities in journalism in general. What do you think is at risk when um, there's not that representation, when, there, when there's not more writers like you in the community talking about your standpoint, your experience, your perspective, as well, you know, and that intermingling as well with all of your professional knowledge. What do you think um, becomes at risk when that, when that's not there? That's an excellent question. I mean, honestly, I feel like what's at risk is just like, there's such a broad and nuanced range of perspectives on society, on culture, on life. And I just think even now in this moment with like Black Lives Matter and just like you're seeing just really naive takes about structural racism where, you know, and you can see it even with COVID and the way that disability gets covered where you have people who are like, we just discovered this thing. And it's like, you have a whole group of people. You've got a bunch of people of color. You've got a bunch of Black people. You've got a bunch of Disabled people were like, no, it was always this way. It was always this way and you just discovered it. And now it's, you didn't really discover anything. It's just, you didn't see it. You didn't acknowledge it. You didn't see it as valid. 
you did. And I think that's what is missing with um, writers not being able to normalize, to represent, to really articulate these very nuanced perspectives um, in how things are covered just everyday things that are covered, the things that, that we end up missing out on, like it, with pop culture, you have all, right now in animation, you have all these different white voice actors of, of uh, animated characters of color who are like, we're stepping down now. We finally figured out this was something that probably, you know, a, a black voice actor should be doing. You just figured this out? You just really now? <laughs> Like, <laughs> come on. Um, <laughs> it's what, I think now think about all those actors that stepped down, like the voice of Apu is stepping out saying like, oh, I didn't know that that was offensive. And a whole, a whole documentary on why this was problematic and you just, you just now, the light bulb came on over your head. Come on. And I think that is the, like there's one thing to have those voices and to have the one or two odd articles that um, reflect this, but if it's normalized, if it's already part of the coverage because you have a large and diverse representation of different types of marginalized writers saying, well, this is bigger than just what you would normally see from this one perspective, then you know, that's just going to change the way that, you know, pop culture is created. It's going to change the kind of stories that get told on a broader level. Um, it's going to change the way audiences see. Like, it, like, I do believe that there's room and there's a value in pop culture and how it changes people's minds and people's hearts. I think that it's important. And I think you know, writers that can explain that um can write critical articles that explore these things for people who may not have thought about these issues that's that's what it gets missing um when you don't have that representation it really also makes me think about um the new book that you came out with the mm -hmm. thing don't say an anthology of chronic illness truths yeah so it's an anthology that's like six years in the making um because the and the um editor uh julie morgan lender will will get into the fact that living with a chronic illness means you don't have the energy to like be able to just pump out a book um in like a year or two so it did take six years i'm so looking forward to reading it although the the ironic part is is that i might have to wait for it to come out on audio uh book before i can really finish it because with my vision loss, it's really hard for me to read like smaller type books, but she is planning on making an audio book for the near future. So I might have to wait for that, um, but we'll see. Uh, but the book is super exciting because it's like, it's international, it's folks from around the world. It's like 50 authors, like a whole range of different um, physical, um, of mental illness and chronic illness and disability. It's, it cuts a wide swath. I'm really excited to have it out in the world because it's such a, it was at such a different point in my life. I actually wrote the essay that's in it a year before. Like it had already been just kind of sitting there for a year and it was at a really bad time where I, like I was really kind of struggling with what it meant. Like it was still before I really started to embrace disability and disabled for myself as an identity and as something that I personally identified as. And I was still struggling with it a lot and just not really, and I didn't really have any answers. It was still, you know, a couple of years into my vision loss getting really bad and having to deal with kind of self loathing and guilt and anger and all these other feelings that I, I feeling I was a burden. There's a lot of really hard feelings. Um, and then, you know, when it was like, okay, this is actually gonna get published, I kind of read and I was like, I'm not this person anymore. But I think that's good, like, because it was kind of earlier on in my own journey. And a lot of people with um, what I have, keratoconus, like especially when you when your vision is going and you don't know what's happening, and like you're going to all these doctors and you're just scared because you can't see and you don't know what's happening with your life. 
having somebody say, you know what, it's, this isn't easy. And like, don't let other people tell you that like you could just suck it up and just keep it moving. What you're feeling is valid. And it was such a snapshot of how I was feeling at a very particular time that I was like, no, I'm going to leave it as is. It was a very different time, honestly, when the book was first started versus now, because I think there is more of a, a dialogue and awareness and a conversation about disability justice in a way that was not a thing in like 2014 where people weren't really talking about it. And so I think it like it took a long time to get here, but it's out at absolutely the best time because I think people are ready in a way that I think there was still quite a bit, not that there isn't stigma now, but I think there was quite a bit of stigma, I think, and we we're talking about it today, that there were people who weren't going to put their name on it, that then that put their name on it now, like it, certain things that would be like, I'm going to be anonymous for this, um, that now people are like, no, this is like, my experience, this is my life, this is like my reality and my journey and I'm going to put my name on it. And I think that is one of the big changes that I, I think has happened in the past five or six years for sure. The way that we are able to, especially with this anniversary, this very monumental anniversary to talk about, you know, the different experiences that have gotten us collectively as a very diverse community to this place like your experience uh navigating accommodations as a child is very different for me um as, as an adult who got diagnosed with my disability as an adult um in the workplace and so it was a shock to me and there was a lot of i think internalized ableism that i had to fight against in my own discovery and in talking to folks at work and talking with my friends and family and loved ones and i think like i know i it's i it's kind of neat also that it's a you know a big neat uh anniversary year that's also an election year um like that it's really pulling together all this like you know the the road for it to become law versus like where it needs to go into the future to really be effective and to and to be powerful for people with disabilities. Like we can really take this time to like not just think about it, but do something about it um, with political action. Um, so it's really, yeah, like I there's a lot going on this year. Um, like you said, um this is an election year like this is a lot's happening and it's still an election year so there's people can still mobilize and get their voice out there and be heard i mean it, they're also taking the census this year like there's a lot mm -hmm. going on where yeah and really who historically have felt like they've been overlooked especially by the government there's a lot of ways this year where people can really get themselves to be to be counted for and and really heard um which is exciting it, it's scary too and it's it's exciting <laughs> yeah it is it is scary but i feel like like it's scary but there's also so much possibility like i really this is kind of an aside but it's kind of connected um like I really started thinking about this idea of how after COVID and everything that's happened, um, how do we start to pull together like accessibility and social justice and digital justice and all of these different ideas. Like there was that space to really have an entry point to talk about what it really means to not just have accessibility but to have like equity and justice and like especially as all these different conversations are happening all over in all these different realms like where we're seeing so much being kind of turned on its head and upset and like disrupted and not in like a startup way but like disrupted like culture and society being disrupted by the pandemic and just by like unemployment like there's this a, a entry point to be really honest and constructive and to rebuild and to 
rebuild with the folks that weren't included in the first place. You know what I mean? Like, and it is scary because like, yeah, it, it's, it's forcing us to have hard conversations often with people who still don't wanna have those conversations. But it's like, it's such an urgent moment right now. And I think to be able to like have an entry point that didn't even exist a year ago to like say, how do we truly bring like inclusivity and justice and accessibility and all these these different ways to make sure that everybody has room at the table for what comes next in our country, in our world. Like I, it, it's thrilling, even as I'm like, oh, this is a lot and it's scary. It's thrilling to me because it just like, I'm ready for it. I think a bunch of us are ready for it. And so like, you know, it's like our, our moment to, to grab and not let go. We have a window of opportunity. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and for me, that's the part that, that scares me because I'm like, if we don't take advantage of this window fully now, mm -hmm. When might we get this chance again? You know, yeah. uh, repercussions of us not taking advantage of this rare opportunity. What is that going to mean long term for us if we don't, you know, if we don't mobilize the way that we're supposed to? Um, but I'm like a naturally pessimist at heart. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, I kind of am too. I'm very like, I don't know if it's going to work, but let's do it. Like, yeah. I, I don't know what that means, but that's how. <laughs> it's like we can get it done, but if we don't, man, oh man. <laughs> like, <laughs> for me, I have a little bit of just like trepidation because I'm like, well, what happens if people try to make all these movements for all these different communities, but the people who are a part of those communities are left out of the narrative? Because uh, yeah. we see that happen all the time where people go like, I think I know what's best for you because because I, you know, I can make up a number of reasons why I think I'm, I know more than someone else about their condition or lived experience. Do you think might be at risk if we don't involve the disabled community, the black community, the LGBTQA community, the brown community, the indigenous community? Yeah. Like, what, like I, I'm always of the belief, like, I, this is where even we do talk about um, intersectionality, where that becomes to me, like it, it's a buzzword and it gets used a lot, but to me, it's it really is a mindset that should be folded into the way that people choose to organize. And I don't necessarily mean organize in a very like specific political organizing way. I think there are different organizations, uh, even artists, there are different ways that organizing looks, but like to have that acknowledgement and understanding of like who's not here at the table as we do this organizing together for, you know, it, uh, justice, for inclusion, for accessibility, who's not here? And like, if somebody says they're not here, one of the things that really kind of bugs me about, I mean, and this is like social justice movements who are, are supposed to be thinking about inclusion is like, there's a real problem with a lot of progressive social justice movements really not seeing or acknowledging disabled people. Even like, it's like, hey, hey, think, like consider us, let's talk about this. And it's like, what? I don't hear you. Um, or I don't choose to acknowledge, it's too much. Um, and it's, it's huge. And even now with everything that's happened with COVID and the way that it's changed how like workplace and just the, all the healthcare issues that are connected to COVID on so many different levels with like folks who are, you know, who get it, they survive, but they're gonna be sick for, you know, with respiratory illness probably for the rest of their lives. And so who are newly disabled, newly, you know, they've acquired a, a disability. Um, 
and how, you know, affordability of healthcare, um, accommodations at work, if they, if you're able to get like all of this stuff intersects with disability justice and even with all the conversations that are happening within social justice movements, it's still like, it's still not being connected to disability justice and it's wild to me. And I feel like as much as it is about kind of creating something new uh, within the different coalitions of folks trying to create something new, having that understanding of who's voices are being heard, who's being acknowledged, what with this, like, is this new structure truly going to be different than the first one, or is it going to still leave people out? Like, and really looking at that in a way that may not be pretty, and it may, it may undo a lot of assumptions about the things that we thought might work better, like, and we might have to rethink those too in order to be more inclusive of everybody, of of disabled people, of brown people, of queer people, of black people, like it's gonna look different than you expect because you don't have that lived experience. And so I think like the messiness of multiple lived experiences, multiple oppressions, mul multiple structural inequities, like really thinking hard about that and being willing to not be comfortable even as we do this work, like to me, that's so important. Um, and I think there are places ready to do that and groups and organizations that are ready to do that, but it's still gonna be a lot of work. Um, and so I guess it's one of those things where I, I'm like, like I'm ready to do it and I'm excited and happy to do it. Um, but I, I think not really, not putting on like rose colored glasses about how hard this work will be. Um, in the future, in the coming years, and even decades to come as we try to create new inclusive realities for folks. The generation right now that, like you were saying, that is coming through surviving COVID and now they're acquiring a new disability. That's a whole new generation of people. And the people who are recovering is still growing. It'll be different if, if mm -hmm. this was handled this it's it, it's going to this is not something that's going to be going away anytime soon and it is going to take a lot of work um and i think it is i like what you said about you know not having the rose colored glasses on um because i feel like when you have rose colored glasses about any movement that you're a part of you get tired very quickly because mm -hmm. you realize that things are closer than what they appear <laughs> you yes. know, <laughs> it's, it's not as it. it's not as joyful anymore and mm -hmm. then your patience runs out and so i think it's really important to be realistic with that like you know this is going to be something that if i'm saying i'm committed to it you know i'm gonna have to be committed to it you know i i just can't listen to these voices for six weeks and then be like i'm tired of it and right I feel like in a way, some of that's happened with Black Lives Matter. I've seen some folks are like, we've got ally fatigue. Every single community that has been disenfranchised in some way has gone through that ally fatigue mm -hmm. where they get a bunch of people jumping on the boat saying that they want to help out and like hold up the signs and whatever for the first week and maybe the second week. And then by the third week, they just want to go home. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like, we're still here, but sure, you go on ahead. <laughs> but yeah, and I, I feel like that's and that's the thing, because people are like, oh well, we did some marching. You know, the Simpsons is gonna have voice actors of color. Our work here is done. Like <laughs> <laughs> So you're talking about patience. It really does require um, not getting frustrated when things aren't as like tied up neatly in a bow um, and just being humbled. I think we all have different levels of whether it's privilege or just be ignorance. If it's ignorance, it's about a, a life 
a lived experience that isn't yours and we all have that and like there is you know having some level of humility about what you don't know and what you can never know because you're not in that person's lived experience and so when it comes to creating coalitions and organizing having the humility to know that there's things that you need to learn from other people in order to move forward together it might take a long time to find your people it may not happen immediately. It might be that your people you think are your people are not, um, and not because they're bad. It's just like it may not be the exact right fit for you um, to empower yourself and to empower others. But more than likely, your people are out there, and it's okay to like take some time to figure that out. And especially when it comes to movement kind of stuff and organizing and, and social justice. Like I personally found my home within disability justice, but it's specifically also with disability justice centered around leaders of color. That's why I was just like, I like I get it. Like it, it just it spoke to me in a way that I didn't even realize I needed until I saw it in action. Um and and that changed me. That changed my life. And so I think like, you know, don't beat yourself up if it takes a while to figure out, like, if you want to help change the world, like there's different ways to do it. And it may not necessarily look the way that it looks for other people. But when you find your people, then you're just gonna like, you'll know and you'll be ready to dig in. This the movement that's happening now, whatever the, it ultimately it's gonna be called this movement that we're yeah. going through now with COVID and everything else. I feel like um, you're definitely mobilized, um, especially within Chicago as a leader. Um, and so, but that's how I feel. That's how a lot of others feel. If you had to describe yourself in a few words, um, what would they be? Oh, oh no, that is so like, which is wacky considering it's like, I'm a writer, describe yourself. I don't know. Oh, that's hard. I used to always, I, I landed on a while ago, like a writer in a complicated relationship with the internet, but also a committed relationship to like social justice and inclusion. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I like that. <laughs> I feel like I need to get you like a cape because I feel like that you sound like a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> I've got I've got a like complicated backstory. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was say like in a few years when Marvel's like redoing all of their characters and adding new ones, they're gonna like have you as one of their like accessibility mm -hmm. inclusion. <laughs> oh yeah, I could be in phase four of the MCU when that finally comes out. Yeah, could right. <laughs> be in Wakanda. <laughs> You could be like Siri's cousin and like yes. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs>